you briefly touched on the the big hormonal changes that happen throughout a woman's life you know life stages really have a significant impact on their life and um this person's very interested in hearing about the metabolic changes you briefly touched on in the female brain starting in mid age so maybe that's a good segue into uh talking about this specifically good and i i want to riff with you dom because um i imagine you're quite familiar with some of these things so um there are so many metabolic changes, and I think it before we get to the brain, the female brain over the age of 40, I think it might be worthwhile to talk about the systemic changes mm-hmm. that occur in women. Mm-hmm. So typically, sometime between 35 and 40, women become more insulin resistant. So there's a few kind of background reasons for that. One is that estrogen begins to decline. Estrogen is the primary hormone that regulates metabolism in the female body. And so as there's less estrogen on board, it leads to a couple of consequences. In practical terms, that includes redistribution of body fat. So what most women experience, and I did this myself, after 40, every decade, most women will gain about five pounds of fat and lose about five pounds of muscle. And that's occurring every decade, unless you're actively doing something against it, like, you know, lifting Mm -hmm. or, you know, otherwise managing your insulin and your metabolic pathways. So there's this background and that leads to redistribution. So a lot of women notice more belly fat, there's less fat, you know, throughout your reproductive lives. So up until 35 or 40, you get more fat deposited at your breasts and your hips and your buttocks. And then after age 40, tends to go more to your belly. So um, most women don't like that. Like even if your weight doesn't change, your clothes don't fit in the same way. And then if you focus on the brain, the work, especially of Lisa Moscone, I think has been so illustrative here because we know that as estrogen starts to decline over the age of 40, there's about a a 20 to 25% decrement in what's known as cerebral metabolism. So the way that the brain utilizes glucose starts to falter, and this is mostly a problem in the mitochondria that I'm sure Dom can talk to a lot more eloquently than I can. But the net result is, you know, what I hear from my patients, I'll say to them, are you noticing that your brain is slowing down over age 40? Like your processing speed isn't quite what it used to be, your executive management, kind of your CEO skills, are not what they were maybe in your thirties. And I get a lot of nods because 80% of women experience this. So there's a lot of ways to address it. You know, the obvious would be, well, what about giving some estrogen kind of topping off that estrogen that's starting to decline, but there's other ways to think about this too. Like what's the role of exercise? What's the role of Mm -hmm. metabolic flexibility? What's the role of ketones? So I, I just threw a softball to you, Dom. Are you going to, how about that? I have a question. So uh, 35 to 40 and the, the, you know, there's insulin resistance in the brain potentially, and then brain blood flow changes too. And, and that is from what you're saying, contingent upon body composition changes. So a decrease in muscle and increase in fat. Uh, So do you, in the patients that you see this in, in, in this kind of uh, subset, do you see that corresponds to an elevation of insulin in that? And I know, you know, Dr. Gabrielle Lyon, I know she's your soul sister and friend. And so we were just talking, <laughs> so she's a huge fan, obviously of you. Uh, so really, really uh, kind of presents this idea of muscle centric medicine, you know, and lean body mass and muscle being the you know, mitochondrial enhancement and a glucose sink and, and, and also an endocrine organ. So releasing, you know, various factors that can improve brain blood flow and growth factors and things like that. So I guess two questions that I'm kind of rambling, but do you see an increase in insulin that corresponds with that brain fog kind of effect? And do you think it's due to a hormone induced decrease in muscle mass and recomposition towards body fat? Yeah, those are great questions. So let me take the first one first. Do I see increasing fasting insulin? So I do anecdotally in my patients. So I've got, 
you know, I used to see like 30 patients a day. The way that I've practiced has changed. I do more, you know, like five patients a day now and I go much deeper. So really dense data sets, including a time series with fasting and postprandial insulin. So I definitely see an increase. That's a trend in women over the age of 40. In terms of the literature showing that, I don't know that we're quite there yet, Dom. Yeah. So that's a hard study to do. <laughs> Not too many people are going to be so doing that anytime soon, probably. To fund a time series, you know, in women from like maybe 30 until they're 55 or well into menopause. Yeah. It's, uh, it's a difficult study to do. I don't know that that's been done, but I definitely, you know, I can tell you, I can think of the graphs right now. I've got a talk on the female brain on Friday and glucose, the way that glucose is trafficked in the body just changes as women shift from premenopause to perimenopause to postmenopause. So mm -hmm. that relates to beta oxidation. It relates to the insulin pathway. And the way that I usually address it is to put a continuous glucose monitor in. So using that, even though we know glucose is kind of late in the sequence of things, I still think it's one of the best ways we have to create a feedback loop, you know, kind of this loop of integrity around personalizing diet. And I'm sure you found this as well. There's just nothing like continuous glucose monitoring to tell people that these foods that you think are so healthy like the apple that you start off each morning with, or, you know, in mm -hmm. my case, squash and potatoes and chickpeas, all of those spike my glucose up to diabetes levels. So these presumably yeah. healthy foods may not be doing you any favors. Yeah. So I don't have a great answer for the, you know, whether on a population level, um, insulin is starting to change, although one of the reasons why Lisa is so interested in looking at this phenotype, these endotypes in the female brain, is that she's trying to understand why do why do women have double the rate of Alzheimer's disease compared to men? And we think it's it is related to these insulin and glucose changes and the cerebral hypometabolism that could be, you know, kind of an early sign. But I would also say we're at the learning to crawl stage. And because I'm a female who's over the age of 40, I've forgotten what your second question was. What was it? Oh, oh, I got uh, it. Body composition. Body yeah. I mean, with men, and I know you treat a lot of men too. So this idea of really muscle being uh, really important, even more important, you know, with age-related sarcopenia as being like your metabolic engine and the organ, we got 50, 40 to 50% of our body <laughs> tissue is muscle. And if that's decreasing proportionally with age, that's going to significantly impair our metabolic health. Yeah, got it. So I agree with that. And it's, uh, you know, when we look at health span, when we look at that period of time that you are relatively free of disease, or the way I think of it is you feel fabulous and you're not mm -hmm. like taking any medication. So that period of health span we know is highly correlated with lean body mass. So one of the best ways that you can slow down the aging process or inflammation, that combination of inflammation and aging is to be a regular exerciser who is tracking lean body mass. What I do in my clients is I track it at least once a quarter. In my NBA players, they get it you know, once a month. So lean body mass, I think, is really critical. And I think you know, putting on my engineering hat, my bioengineering hat, I think in terms of inputs and outputs. And so in terms of inputs, I'm thinking a lot about nutrition, uh, genomics, uh, stressors, the amount of sleep you're getting, mm -hmm. uh, purpose, love, and connection, all of those things that relate to metabolic health. And then in terms of outputs, I'm thinking about how are you exercising? How are you preserving or maybe even growing your lean body mass as you get older? And I would really challenge all the people who are listening to this to be thinking about this, like not just some sort of passive, yeah, well, I'm getting my walk in five days a week and I go for 20 minutes. No, that's not going to do it. Like if you really want to turn around the metabolic train, you've got to be thinking about, okay, what's best for my cardiometabolic health? And at this point, I would say it's probably an hour a day, five to six days a week for optimal health for optimal health span for optimal metabolic health 
and about 50% strength training, lifting heavy, and about 50% cardio. So that's my summation of the literature. You might disagree with that, Dom. I'm curious. No, I, uh, I'm glad you mentioned weight training because I do think, I mean, I've even seen over the last maybe 15 years, I've been losing like a pound of lean body mass a year almost, but yeah, you know, I, I had a high starting point, but, uh, and that's doing everything kind of possible. Right. <laughs> so, um, but you know, so I think it's important to understand not just the scale weight, but, uh, you know, even getting a DEXA and I just got a DEXA, it was like 80 bucks. And the information from that, if you just do a DEXA scan once a year and for women, especially it has the bone mineral density, that's going to be really important, but you get your, your weight and your body composition and just having a longitudinal record of that each year. So it gives you uh, a goal that you could shoot towards. If you know, you know, where you're starting from, you can predict and make a plan for where you want to go. And I think that's, that's really important. Yeah. You just, um, use some, of my love language. So I just want to call this out because longitudinal records time series, I think are so essential for optimizing your health personally. You know, mm -hmm. we've had in medicine throughout the past century, our focus has really been on randomized trials and population based health and the truth is that's imprecision medicine. You know, you look at something like the prescription of statins for elevated ApoB or LDL. Yeah. You know that we have to treat like 25 to 50 people for one person to benefit. And yeah. to me, that's appalling. Whereas if we can do time series, if we can do these longitudinal records where you have a dashboard of the markers that matter the most for you, and then you're looking at these end of one experiments, little experiments that you can do to see if you can optimize your biomarkers and the way that your genes are expressed. To me, that that is the heart of precision medicine. Yeah. So the end of one longitudinally and then manipulating and tweaking things as you go, I think is incredibly valuable. I've been a huge fan of N of one, especially I have, you know, in connection with dozens of people doing it. And I think it's so incredibly insightful. And uh, even from you know a scientific perspective, I think it's the data is gold. And I know uh, guys like I just was in just flew back from California, but Dave Feldman is working on a big project with lean mass hyper responders, where you have you know very elevated you know LDL in response to a very low carb diet, and uh, and collecting longitudinally you know some data on that. And I think that's an interesting question, but. And I've been doing that myself, you know, with the elevated and maybe I'll get your opinion on that later, but, but yeah, I appreciate your, your appreciation for longitudinally and the N of one kind of that we can all do and that we should all start doing sooner than later, right? We need to get some, some basic tests done. You know, we mentioned the DEXA scan, but when it comes to female hormones too, and maybe let's take a step back, not only in treating the problem, but identifying and then characterizing what the problem is, if there's a problem, uh, what tests and at what I know earlier, the earlier you start, the better. So what tests do you recommend kind of out of the gate for that 30 year old or 40 year old, you know, woman or man, uh, what tests do you recommend kind of as for baseline? 